Welcome to our verse-by-verse -verse study through the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. The first words in Genesis are, in the beginning. Genesis is a book of beginnings. It describes the beginning of the universe and everything in it. It also describes the beginning of God's relationship with mankind, how that relationship was broken by mankind's desire to do their own things, to go their own way, and also the beginning of God's plan to restore mankind back to the relationship that he created us for. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells us that the greatest thing that you can do with your life is to love God with your whole being and to love others. God created us to be the objects of his love and then poured his love into our hearts so that we could love him back and also love others. As we journey through the book of Genesis, we will learn more about the God who loves us and experience more of the blessings of his amazing love. So grab a cup of coffee, open your Bible to the beginning, to the book of Genesis, as we grow in our knowledge of God and his plan for our lives. So turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 41, Genesis 41, as we continue our study through the book of Genesis. We're in that section that is talking about, is looking at the life of Joseph. And as I look back on my life, I wish I had been more like Joseph. I mean, he is one of the great examples of faith that, um, that if, we can, if we can model his, many of his behaviors, we would be much, much better, much further along in our faith. So let's pray. This is a really long chapter, and we're actually going to get through all 57 verses today. Somebody say, I don't believe you. He believes. Thank you, Jeremy. Let's pray. We'll get into this. And look at this remarkable man. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for this day, for this time, for this place. And as we get into your word, Lord, we pray, open our hearts to receive what you would say to us, Lord. Not because, um, not because of us, not because of this church, but because you deserve the fullness of our lives. You deserve every bit of us completely open and transparent to you, to be used by you for your glory, for the blessing of others and the growing of faith. We love you, Lord. We ask for your, your spirit to move amongst us, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the last chapter, Joseph is in prison after being falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. And in that chapter, two new prisoners showed up. Pharaoh's chief butler or cupbearer, and the chief baker. They both have dreams at some point. We, we don't, don't imagine they were in that prison for very long. I think they're, part of this was God's providence, getting them into the prison so they could have these dreams, so all these events could unfold the way that they did. They both have dreams in the same night, and they're very similar dreams, but not the same. And because there was no one there to interpret these dreams, they're sad, and Joseph comes in, sees that they're sad, and says, hey, what's, what's the deal? And they, you know, they tell him that, you know, we had these dreams, but there's nobody here to interpret our dreams, so, you know, wah, 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 wah. So Joseph offers to interpret the dreams for them, to go to God, to receive an interpretation from God. And remember, you remember the account, the butler, cupbearer cup gets good news, and the baker gets bad news, Right? Remember, if you missed it, go back and read it. Well, Joseph, after giving him good news, says, hey, remember me. Tell somebody about my situation because, you know, he had been, you know, been sold by his brothers into slavery, and then he was falsely accused. He hadn't done anything wrong. He had, matter of fact, been doing everything right, and he ends up in prison. And so he's saying, hey, you know, tell somebody my story because I really want to get out of here. Butler gets out, gets out of prison, and promptly forgets about Joseph. Joseph, you can sense from the text, that he believes that the whole thing is orchestrated and arranged by God. And so he believes God's in the mix of this, but, you know, then, you know, nothing happens. Verse, 40, or verse 1 of chapter 41 says this, Then it came to pass, at the end of two full years, that Pharaoh had a dream, and behold, he stood by 
the river. So two years pass after Joseph believes God's moving. Maybe this is the, it. He, I'm going to get out now. And then two years go by. And Joseph may have even imagined that everybody had forgotten him. Everybody that is except God. As Joseph slept in that dark, dismal dungeon, little did he know that it would be his last night there. Everything was about to change for Joseph. And when the time was right, God spoke to Pharaoh in a dream. And we need to understand that. You know, we, we might imagine as Christians that God only speaks to believers, only speaks to Christians. No. No, he's, he's speaking to others as well. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us one of the realities of the end times is he's going he's gonna to speak to people in visions and dreams and draw people to himself in radical ways. And so we, we should not be surprised when somebody tells us that they've had a dream that they think might be from God. We ought to encourage them and say, yeah, maybe you did. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the God that gave you that dream. So Pharaoh gets his dream. Verse 2, suddenly as he's, this is the, the dream, came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Ooh, that's a great dream so far. You know, the, the Nile, the river he's talking about is the Nile. It, it's of utmost importance to the Egyptians. They, a lot of their, I mean, their, their whole agriculture system depended upon the Nile River and it overflowing every year and bringing fertile soil from up north or back, I don't know where it comes from. It comes from Ethiopia, wherever that is in relation to Egypt. And it, and it, and it, and it gives them everything they need, their food, everything is, is focused on it. Not only that, but a, a chunk of their religion is also focused on the Nile River. The, they, they see it as a, a source of, of life. Matter of fact, it, they, they look at it as the source of life. And so a lot, of, a lot of religion and a lot of their, you know, their everything kind of was focused around the Nile River. So it was a big deal. And so, you know, getting this, this vision of, this, of these seven cows coming up fat and, and fine looking and they're, and they're eating peacefully in the meadow, that's, you know, sounds like a pretty good dream so far, right? Verse three, then verse three happens. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, that means thin, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river and the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows, so Pharaoh awoke. Yeah, that was a pretty, that turned a dream to a nightmare and instantly. Imagine that, you know, seven gnarly-looking cows coming up and eating, you know, these other cows. And, and you know, that, that doesn't happen, right? I mean, most of you have never seen a cow eat a cow, right? Because they don't eat, they don't eat meat. They eat, you know, grass and corn and stuff like that. And so he, he goes from this dream to a nightmare. Verse five, he slept and dreamed a second dream, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. That sounds similar to the first part of the dream. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, that means shriveled and shrunk, sprang up after them, and the seven thin heads devoured the seven plumped heads, set plump and full heads, so Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. Now it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men, and Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Pharaoh is troubled by these dreams because he recognizes that there's something significant about them because they were, because there were two dreams and they were so similar to one another, and they both, they both suggest something bad is going to happen. Something bad, you know, is, is being communicated to him, but he doesn't understand what it is. Now, we, we have a little background. In Egypt, dreams are very important, and they had a whole culture that was surrounded, this concept of dreams. They had, they had dream experts with dream books for interpreting dreams. And, and remember, at this time, Egypt is the most powerful nation in the world, and Pharaoh is the most powerful man in Egypt, and he has access to all of the, the smartest people around, right? I mean, you would imagine that. He's got access to every wise and intelligent and smart and all of that. Egypt is a picture 
often used in Scripture to, to tell us something about the world, specifically the world that rejects God and his word. Pharaoh gets this vision, and then he does what most of the world does. He's struggling with the same thing that our world today, the world that rejects God and his word. He's trying to find answers to spiritual problems while at the same time rejecting the source of spiritual truth and wisdom. If you reject the source of the answers, how do you, how do you answer your questions? Can you answer your questions? Well, they do. They just don't do it with truth. Most of the problems of this world. Can, can anybody say that, we're, that there's trouble in this world? That, that this world is struggling, right? This nation is struggling. And the, the problem is that they're, they're identifying and saying, it's the, this is the problem, this is the problem, this is the problem. And, and we understand, most of the problems of this world are not social problems. They are not justice problems. They are not race problems. They are not identity, gender identity problems. That's not the problem. The problem is spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, but the natural man, the natural man is the man who rejects God and his word, does not accept God's word as truth. The natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Right? That, that makes sense. If you don't believe God and his word, then the God and his word is, is, is silly. It's foolish. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. When someone who does not believe God, rejects God, does not believe his word, and, and mocks and laughs at the things of God, don't be surprised. That is the only way he can or she can respond to it because they, they look at those things as foolish. Everything that happens in this life happens for a purpose and a reason, everything. And it's meant to draw us deeper into the light of God's glory, his grace, his mercy, his love. If you reject God and his word, what's left? If you're not being drawn into God's love and his grace and his mercy into his light, then what is left? Well, darkness is all that's left. John 12, 46, I have come as a light into the world, Jesus speaking, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Most of this world is living in darkness, and they don't realize it. They don't know that it's dark. They're wandering around in the dark with the other people wandering around in the dark, and they just, they just think this is the way it's supposed to be. Faith in Jesus, believing that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, brings us out of the darkness, it, it, it transports us out of the darkness, and places us into the light of God, into God's light, into his grace, his mercy, his love, his truth. The only way out of the darkness is by faith in Jesus Christ. There is no thing we can do. There is no activity. There's no, there's no amount of giving. There's no, there's no good deeds. None of those things do it. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. It brings us out of the darkness and into the light. And then we walk in that light by obedience to his revealed word, the Bible. If you want to walk in the light, the Bible tells us you do it through obedience to God and his word. You put ourselves in the scene. Pharaoh's sitting there on his throne, and he's, he's telling people. You know, he's saying, oh, you got all his wise people spread out there. They got all their you know, stuff and their books and all that stuff going on. And the Pharaoh's saying, hey, man, I, I had this really weird dream last night, two really weird dreams, and they're freaking me out. I need you to tell me what they mean. And they're like, they're, you don't know. Standing there nearby is is the butler, the cupbearer. That was his place, to stand nearby, the pharaoh. So if he needed something, it was the butler's responsibility to get it for him. 
He's standing there listening to all of this as he sees the concern on Pharaoh's face and hears it in his voice and sees all of these experts out there with, with their, and they're all like scratching their head. They have no idea how to answer him. Verse, verse nine, he responds, or he speaks up. Then the chief butler, or cupbearer, told his dream to Joseph. Oh, sorry, wrong chapter. I, I backed up a whole chapter. It, started, it was actually making sense for a second. That was weird. <laughs> because of the chief butler, it says, I just, like, made perfect sense. Then the chief butler, verse nine, in the right chapter, spoke to Pharaoh, saying, I remember my faults this day when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker. We each had a dream in one night. He and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard, that would be Potiphar, and we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass, just as he interpreted for us, so it happened, he restored me to my office and he hanged him. Verse 14, then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon and he shaved and changed his clothing and came to Pharaoh. Try to imagine what this was like for Joseph. You know, he's putzing around in the, you know, the prison doing his duties and whatnot. All of a sudden, a bunch of people come in. They snatch him out of the prison. They take him to get him cleaned up. And then he's standing in the presence of Pharaoh, the, the most powerful man in the land, possibly in the whole world at that time. Slave prisoner Joseph is suddenly ushered into the presence of Pharaoh. And this powerful man says to this socially and politically unimportant and powerless man, I need your help. Verse 15, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it, but I've heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. You know, Joseph's character comes out, as, as, you, as you study these texts, you see his character start to manifest, I mean, manifest throughout all of the encounters we see with him. But it's, it's amazing his responses to Pharaoh here. Re remember, he was, he was betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. He was, we, he was then falsely accused by Potiphar's wife it ended up in prison. He's had a tough road. And he has, he's standing now in front of the man who can change his destiny. Joseph doesn't know what the future holds for him. He doesn't know that, hey, you know, I'm, I'm standing before Pharaoh. I'm not really sure why. Okay, Pharaoh says, okay, I've got some dreams here. You can uh, interpret them. But he doesn't know what happens after that. Is he headed back to prison? Or is something else going to happen? He doesn't, the way he expresses himself, he doesn't exalt himself. He doesn't lay his case before Pharaoh. He just says, hey, I can't do it, but God in heaven, God can. The, as a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's literally says the God, which is interesting speaking to a man who believes he might be God. One of the things that's also amazing about this response is that he promises Pharaoh that God's response will give him peace. That God's response will give this unbeliever peace. That reminds me of Paul's words. One of my favorite verses among the 3,418 other favorite verses. <laughs> Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. We, we often go to wrong sources for peace. We often look for peace in our circumstances, through our circumstances. But what that verse tells us is that 
Peace is not a product of circumstance. It is a fruit of faith. If you want peace, you get it through faith, not through your circumstances, not through a changing of your circumstances. I'll be happy, I'll be okay if this happens. No, probably won't. Reality says, no, you probably won't. Pharaoh's response is interesting because he doesn't challenge anything that, that Joseph says. He just seems to accept it. Verse 17. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I stood on the bank of the river. Suddenly seven cows came up out of the river, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. Then behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly and gaunt. Such ugliness I have never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the gaunt and ugly cows ate up the first seven the fat cows, and when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were just as ugly as, the, as at the beginning, so I awoke. So he, you know, he says, I saw these cows, these, these thin, ugly ones, ate the big ones, and it didn't look like they had eaten anything. Something funny in that. I'm just going to let that go right now. So I also saw in my dream, suddenly seven heads came up on one stalk, full and good. Then behold, seven heads with withered and thin and blighted by the east wind sprang up after them and the thin heads devoured the seven good heads so i told this to the magicians but there was no one who could explain it to me then joseph said to pharaoh the dreams of pharaoh are one god has shown pharaoh what he is about to do he said both dreams are the same they both mean the same thing notice again no exaltation of himself he takes no credit for the, for the interpretation. All he does is say, this is what it means. God says, this is what it means. Verse 26. The seven good cows are seven years. The seven good heads are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven thin and ugly cows which come up after them are seven years. And the seven empty heads, lighted by the east wind, are seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Indeed, seven years of great plenty will come throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them seven years of famine will arise, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine will deplete the land. So the plenty will not be known in the land because the famine following it will be very severe. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God, and Godly will shortly bring it to pass. Here's, here's what's going on. The people of Egypt, rarely did they experience famine because the Nile always provided them all the water they needed to, to you know, have our agriculture and all the other things. It was rare to have a famine in Egypt, and it was exceedingly rare. As a matter of fact, it was unheard of for a famine of multiple years. And so, so that's why they struggled to interpret the dream. In, in their minds, it was always going to be good. You know, anybody ever think about that? You know, we, we have good years, but it's always going to be like this. I was about to get really political there for a second. I'm going to stop. You can interpret that any way you want. Joseph is confident he's heard from God. And, and, he, and he believes that he's interpreted the, the, the dreams correctly. Before we read the next verse, we've got to put this back into context, put it back in the, in the place. As Joseph is standing there, just maybe an hour or so earlier, he was in prison where he was likely to spend the rest of his life. And now he's standing before the most powerful man in the land. Verse 33, he says this. Now therefore, now therefore, he says, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years and let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land may not perish during the famine. So not only does Joseph interpret the dreams, he also counsels 
Pharaoh and what to do about it. That is remarkable to me. Joseph, who is a slave prisoner standing before Pharaoh, surrounded by all of his wise men, tells Pharaoh what to do. One of the truest signs of a heart that has been redeemed by Jesus, that has been saved and, and cleansed and redeemed, is, is love for those who are hard to love. Is love for those that we don't have to love. For love for those who are not like us. Is love for those who hate us. Jesus said in Luke 6, I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. I know, I know you're paying attention to the world around you. In less than a decade, something dramatic has changed in our culture, radically changed in our culture. It's not, it's not new. It's been going on for decades but we've seen a huge shift in the last six or seven, eight years. Now, we have never been a perfectly united United States, right? Do we acknowledge that? There, there's always been something going on. Somebody's not happy about something somewhere. But today, there is incredible division in our nation, um, unbelievable division in our nation. And there are groups that are actively, openly promoting hate. They are, they are actively encouraging one group to hate another group. And they're doing it along lines of race or sexuality or political opinion, pick some way of dividing people up, and there are groups that are out there promoting, encouraging hate. Oh, they'll say that's, what that's not their purpose, but that's what's coming out of it. And not just in the world. The part that grieves my spirit the most is that there are churches fueling the fire of hate from their pulpits. Listen, Joseph had no human reason to not hate the Egyptians. He had every reason to hate the Egyptians. I mean, he was a slave to them, and he had been falsely accused and imprisoned by them. He had every human reason to hate. And as an expression of God's love for all humanity, Joseph, with the confidence of his faith, tells Pharaoh how to save Egypt. Hey, 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 Pharaoh, bad times are coming, but this is how you can save your country, your nation. It is never right for any of us, especially a Christian, to say, hey, just let it all burn. That's not God's will. God's will is that we would call all to repentance, call all to be, escape the judgment and the fire that is coming. And we do it through expressions of love, not hate. Never in the church, never from a Christian, should there be anything that leads someone else to have a response of hate. Now, now, now you can't stop people from doing what they're going to do. But our, our actions, our behaviors, our words ought to be drawing them toward the light, toward God and his grace and his mercy and his hope and his love. Never towards hate. Verse 37. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his, all his servants. <clears throat> and Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they cried out before him, bow the knee 
So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said, also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Within the span of an hour or two, Joseph goes from prison garb to palace robes. He goes from a dark dungeon to a golden chariot. He goes from the lowest place to the highest place, the second highest place. Radical. And notice in verse 3, 43, it says, bow the knee. Everyone that sees Joseph in his chariot, in his robes, or whatever, with the signet ring, is going to bow to Joseph. Well, I wonder if that actually started to get him to think about those dreams that he had 13 years earlier. Reminded him that he had dreams of people bowing before him. It was his brothers and his, and his parents will eventually bow before him. Everything is changing for Joseph. Verse 45. <clears throat> and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephnath Paneah, and he gave him as wife Azanath, the daughter of Pada, Potipharah, the priest of On. Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in, this, now in the seven plentiful years, the ground brought forth abundantly, meaning more than was normal, it brought forth. So he gathered up all the food of the seven years, which were in the land of Egypt, and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting, for it was immeasurable, which is unusual because the Egyptians were all about detail and records and all of that. So the fact that there was so much they stopped counting it means there was a lot, a lot. There, God was, making, was bringing to pass what he said was going to happen. Where was I? Nope. And, Joseph, and to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph named, called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. For 13 years, life had been pretty hard for Joseph. Probably not continuously, but it had been pretty hard. And then he has these seven years where he's, where he's the second in command. So things are going pretty good. God is going to give Joseph two sons. And one of the things we should notice about that, he gives his sons Hebrew names, not Egyptian names. That's important. Even though Joseph is, is absolutely immersed in the culture of Egypt, it's not who he is. And he clings to his identity as a man of the Hebrews, as a, as a son of his father. And the name Manasseh has the idea or the meaning of God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. When Joseph says forget, it doesn't mean that he doesn't remember. Because in reality, it would be hard to forget some of the things that actually happened to him. What it means is they, he wasn't in bondage to those things, to those hard things of his life. John Corson says this, those who can't forget about their past walk through life crippled. If you cling to your past, if your past has a hold on you, it will cripple you. And if you lived in that state for very long, you might not even realize it. You're walking around crippled, and you don't even realize. <laughs> Somebody changed something. <laughs> okay, there we go. <laughs> All of a sudden, David and Jeremy go running out. <laughs> thinking little fingers were touching things. No, we don't even know. Just a mystery. Okay. Because this is the key point. I mean, listen. Listen. You know, the reality of bad things happen to people, right? Anybody, anybody recognize that bad things happen to people? Things that have the ability to create enormous wounds and scars in the heart. And some that are so great and so deep that we might even imagine that it's impossible to get past them. Our God is the God of the impossible. Our past can be a prison for our body and soul, but it doesn't have to be. God saves us 
so that we can be free of what? Sin. Sin. Whose sin? Mine. And whose else? Everyone else around me. Anything that someone's done to me, I can be free of it because Jesus died to make me free of it. Philippians 3.13. But one thing I do, the Apostle Paul speaking, who knew what it was like to be experience bad things, forgetting those things which are behind me, not meaning I don't remember them, it means I'm just not letting them hold on to me, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Listen, as long as you're reaching back and grabbing a hold of your past, as long as your past has a hold of you, you cannot reach forward. You cannot reach the prize. It's impossible. It can feel impossible, no question, because some of the thirds that people experience are just too big, too much. Ask for help. Sometimes the only way out is to let somebody else help you out. And if you don't, then that prison you're, you're living in, you're carrying a while, you're dragging around with you, you're going to stay in it, and you're going to suffer, and it's going to hold you back from all, that, all the good that God has for your life. The name of Joseph's second son gives us a reason why this is so important. Verse 52, name of the second called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Listen, you cannot be fruitful and live in the past. You cannot be fruitful and let the past hold you in the past. If you want to be fruitful, meaning you want to you experience the good that God has for you, you have to let go of the past. Fruitfulness comes when we are in a moment-by-moment living relationship with Almighty God by faith in Jesus Christ, experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit through the teaching and the ministry of the Word of God. Just as Joseph interpreted, the seven years of abundance were replaced by famine. Verse 53. Then the seven years of plenty which were in the land of Egypt ended, and the seven years of famine began to come. As Joseph had said, the famine was in all the lands, but in the land of Egypt was bread. So when the land of Egypt was famished, meaning very hungry, hungry to the point of starvation, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread, Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So what this says is 3,700 years ago, there was a problem with climate change. So just, just saying don't get caught up in all the drama. Just as, just as God said through the dream, there's going to be seven years of famine, there's going to be, or seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine, you know, seven years was going to end. And, you know, and the same thing is true. You know, climate goes through cycles. In this case, this was God-driven. It happened this way because this is the way God made it happen. And there's a reason for it. We're going to get into that in subsequent chapters. And then the final verse of this chapter sets us up for the next chapter, for chapter 42, verse 57. So all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all the lands. Next time, we're going to see that Joseph is going to have the encounter with his brothers where his brothers will come and they will bow before him and they're seeking grain and all of that. We'll catch that next time. If I had to pick one word to describe Joseph. I, I spent some time with this. What, was, what one word describes Joseph? And the word that I came up with was faithful. Joseph was faithful. In chapter 37, he was being faithful to his father when he told his father what his brothers were doing. You know, they were, they were, they were messing around, and they were not doing what they're supposed to do, what their father had told them to do. And Joseph, who cared about his father's things, told his father what was going on. He was faithful to Potiphar in chapter 39 
by working hard and refusing to sleep with Potiphar's wife. He was being faithful to Potiphar. He was faithful in chapter 40 in the prison to work hard. And when he interpreted the dreams of the, of the butler and the baker, he was being faithful to his situation. And in this chapter, he's being faithful to Pharaoh by interpreting the dreams and then working hard to save Egypt from the famine that was coming. Joseph was faithful wherever he was. And, and we, all, we all got to recognize that it wasn't always good for Joseph. There was hard stuff going on. And in reality, his father and Potiphar and, and the prison keeper or Pharaoh were not the object of his faithfulness. Joseph was being faithful to God. At every opportunity, Joseph referred to God as the source of his morality, of his hope, of his wisdom, of his power. Everything that Joseph did pointed to God, and he was faithful to God wherever he was. When, when God is the object of our faithfulness, we stop focusing on our circumstances. We stop focusing on whether our circumstances are good or bad. When God is the object of our faithfulness, it is just what it is. It's life. And sometimes we can look at life and say, this is bad. Or we can look at life and say, this is good. But faithfulness to God doesn't depend upon our circumstances. Three things I'm going to point to that talk of and help us with that. First, let go of the past. You cannot be faithful to God and cling to the past. As long as your past has a hold on you, as long as it is the, the center of your attention, it is, it is something you're always looking back to, you're always being drawn back to, you will not be free to do what God is calling you to do today. <laughs> it's just you can't. If you're always looking back, God, God's not telling you to go back. He's telling you to go forward. Let go of the past. Second, accept the present. Joseph didn't mope around and whine and complain about his life and what was going on and why this was unfair and all of that. He got to work and he worked hard wherever he was. He did He did seek ways to change his circumstances, like when he talked to the, to the butler after he'd given him that, that positive interpretation of the dream. He said, hey, remember me. You know, tell somebody about my circumstances because I'd like to get out of here. But he stayed busy being faithful even after that. He continued to be faithful. Third, trust God for the future. As Joseph stood before Pharaoh, he could have done a lot of things, could have said a lot of things about himself right there. Could have told him about how, how unfair it was that he was in prison, how unfair it was that his brothers had betrayed him, how, you know, he was, you know, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a dream interpreter. I'm, I'm, I'm amazing. He didn't do that. He simply exalted God, pointed Pharaoh to God. Because he didn't know. He didn't know it was coming. He didn't know if this was a temporary you know, reprieve from prison and he was heading back after the Pharaoh was done with him. He trusted God with his future. Too often, I think we find ourselves in difficult circumstances and we, that we'll do anything we can to get out of them. And sometimes God would just call us to trust him. I think sometimes we, we might get ourselves out of prison, but not very far out. When Joseph trusted God, he got, him, he got him more than just out of prison. He elevated him to the second highest position in the land. Trust God. Listen, God has a much better plan for your future than you do. And he has, and he has all the tools, all the resources to get you there. If you settle for what you think you can get out of the future, it'll always be less than what God can get for you. Trust him. Whatever your circumstances, one thing, one thing you can get out of this message, one thing you get out of this reality of, of who Joseph is, is be faithful to God and work hard. You see that all throughout his, his life. Be faithful to God and work 
hard. When? Always. If your circumstances change, what should you do? Be faithful to God and work hard. If your situation gets better, be faithful to God and work hard. If your situation gets worse, be faithful to God and work hard. Do what is right and good right now, and you keep doing it until God does something. Let go of the past, accept the present, trust God for the future, and be faithful and work hard. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Lord, as we have taken this time and, and Lord, um, looked at Joseph and the message and the, and the reality of who he is, Lord, we want to we wanna remind ourselves that, that he often is used as a picture or a type of Christ. And while we got to be careful not to let that, that picture get too wacky, which sometimes preachers will do, Lord, we always ought to be looking to Christ. We always ought to be drawing our attention to him. And so as we take this time and close this message, that we know, Lord God, that, that, that you did something that was so remarkable. You were faithful, Jesus, to the Father. And you did a work that is impossible for us. We thank you, God, that you sent Jesus for us that he stepped down out of the perfection of heaven and walked on this, this sinful earth and did it perfectly, being faithful to you every step along the way, even when it got hard, even as the betrayals and the persecution grew and, and, and intensified to the point of being handed over to the Romans for crucifixion. And you went to that cross, Jesus, willingly went to that cross so that we could be free, so that we could be free of our own sin, that we could be free of the sins of others, so that we could know the freedom that only comes through the cross. And no longer does our past have to hold us. No longer does our, do our pr present circumstances have to derail us from being faithful to you, that because of Christ, we can live a, a life that is different, that is good, that is fruitful. So we come here humbly, thanking you for your presence here today, God. Holy Spirit, we're asking, Lord, for an outpouring, a mighty outpouring of your Spirit upon us that we might, that we might know that freedom, not just believe it, but know it in a way that draws us into a, in, further out into the light Lord, help each of us, Lord, to examine our own hearts. Lord Jesus, when you died on the cross, you, you, are, you are worthy. You've always been worthy of all of our faith. That, Lord, you're calling us to walk through this life faithful to you and working hard. And so I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here and they're, and they're they can look at their own life and, and recognize that maybe they have not been as faithful to you as they should be, that they would repent of that right this very moment and ask you to forgive them. And Holy Spirit, that you would help them to be more faithful to you. And Lord God, we've been, we are living in a world that has gotten, gotten harder to, to, to work hard and be faithful to you. And so I pray, Lord, that you would equip each of us to do what is right every day, every time. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your love. And Lord, if there's someone here who has never, never recognized the fact that they are a sinner, that their sin is, they, they sin not because of their circumstances or this world, they sin because there is something inside of us that draws us to sin. And Lord God, you called us to be free. You, set, you died on the cross to free us from that. And so if someone here has not received your forgiveness of sins, they've not repented of their sins, they've not turned to you and believed that you died for their sins, that they would do that right this very moment. They would recognize they need you, that eternal life is only possible through you, and that freedom from the judgment that's coming to this world is only possible through you, through faith in you, trusting you, hoping in you, believing in you and walking with you. 
If someone here has not received Christ, I pray they'd open their hearts right this very moment. Allow God to come in and to cleanse them and put them on that path toward what is good and right. Lord, we thank you for all that you are and do in our lives, and we give this day to you, praising you and thank you, Lord God, that you did send Jesus for us, the Holy Spirit is with us, and that someday we will spend all of eternity with you in heaven. We praise you, we love you, and we thank you, and we lift up this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us on this exciting journey through the book of Genesis. We publish these messages as an expression of our love and worship of God. It's our desire that they would glorify God, bless others, and grow faith. If there's anything that we can do to help you on your journey of faith, please do not hesitate to reach out and connect to us. The best way to do that is by going to ccfv.life slash connect. There you'll find all the different ways that you can connect to us. As Christians, we are already connected in Christ. And one of the ways that we would like to engage with you is in the area of prayer. If you would like us to pray for you, please send your prayer request to prayer at calvaryfv.com or text the word pray to 951-419-5396. If this material has been useful to you, please leave a comment or review this channel or don't forget to subscribe to it so that you don't miss other things that we publish. Also, please pray that God would use these messages to help others find hope in Jesus Christ. You can also partner with us financially by going to calvaryfv.com slash give or text the word give to 951-419-5396. Until next time, go be radical with Jesus.